yeah hello welcome um, to a new video um, this will be um, somewhat different um, because um, in reply to one of the blitz games um, I got a request to to do videos on um, end games and um, it's uh, especially end game strategy or, or general principles so not um, basic end games with um, very reduced material but um, somewhat um, more complicated positions with with um, more material on the board where strategic planning is required um yeah of course this is um not a really easy subject so if um i would um cover all this decently it would be um a lot of videos and um i simply I don't have the time to to do a full coverage of um, of different subjects there so uh, what I'll do is um, I'll make um, just one um, one example pretty interesting one which illustrates um, a very basic uh, endgame principle and this is um, principle of two weaknesses and uh, also I recommend a specific book that um, is pretty much um, yeah the, maybe the best book or at least uh, the most uh, recommended book if it comes to um, the subject of endgame strategy and this is um, um, rather an old book um, I, I looked it up and uh, dug it out of my um, my library here and uh, the one one I have here of course it's in German but um, it's from uh, 1985 the one I have here and the original publication um, is from 1981 and it's by an international master, Michal Cherishevsky, is his name. I'll um, put the name and um, the details of the book also in the in the video description so you can, can easily um, look it up on um, on Amazon or whatever. Um, it's not um, a really huge book. My German version here has got uh, yeah, close to 200 pages. But uh, the author does a great job of selecting um, very instructive examples um, and groups them nicely into um, common common themes. Um, I just quote um, some uh, some chapters here. It's like um, centralization of the king, um, problems with exchanges, pawn play in the end game, thinking in schemes principle of two weaknesses and so on. I think um, this is really um, a very a very good book for this um, kind of subject. Um, what you uh, need to know um, about the author because uh, most likely you uh, won't know the, won't know him. Um, I tried to, to dig out uh, some some um, information about the author and it uh, proved pretty difficult. It seems that um, he made his uh, international master, master title in the 70s and um, then basically retired from uh, from practical play to become a trainer. So um, if you read an oh, international master, I don't know, there are so many of them. And well, um, he was a pretty strong international master back then with a rating of about 2,500, if I found it correctly. And back then, a <clears throat> rating of 2,500 meant something like top 100 in the world so he wasn't a bad player at all and back then it was um pretty um yeah it was it was, it was, <clears throat> it was a lot more difficult to get the grandmaster title so it's um it's not a big deal that he um it's not a grandmaster for instance the world famous russian trainer arguably the most famous trainer in chess um mark dvoretsky is also just an international master so <clears throat> yeah i can recommend this book heavily and uh, now i'll show one example from this book and uh, actually um when i got the suggestion um, um of this theme um i um immediately thought of this book and also of this example because um i remembered it um that that I studied it I don't know fifteen twenty years ago or something and I was quite impressed by the um, by the clarity of the the plans here um, from um, from an old game nineteen twenty two played in London between um, 
pronunciation, I don't know, um, of course, two world champions, Alakine and, and Oeuvre. So, um, got a pretty high profile battle here. Um, the book actually starts um, with this position, which is on the board here. Um, why to move? It's the 17th move. So, it's uh, just after the opening um, where Oeuvre made some. Uh, yeah, some mistake and um, actually ended up in this pretty horrible position. Um, of course, the main feature of the position is the difference um, between White's um, excellent knight on e4 and uh, Black's dreadful bishop in g7. So you can see the bishop is uh, very much limited um, by the pawn on e5, and also Black's pawns. Um, yeah, are all already on dark squares on the queen side, which is um, not a good um, not a good sign. And of course, black also has got the very weak double pawns here on e5 and e6, which also mean that the knight on e4 um, has got a brilliant outpost. It will never be removed by any piece there. But it's um, it's not completely easy to. Um, find a way to make progress. Um, let's just um, play a couple of moves here. Um, White now played um, rook f to d1. An important point here is that uh, black who responded king f8 is not able to play c5 c4 which is a de desirable move in general to put um, pawns on light squares the opposing color of the bishop to give the bishop more room, maybe come to f8 and do something along this diagonal here. Um, this is not possible here because of um, a simple tactical reason. White has just um, knight to d6 <coughs> and will win, will win the pawn on c4. And this is just an extra pawn and uh, all the positive sides about the position on still exists and knight is still better can return to e4 so black cannot play c4 black king f8 white went king f1 which is in general desirable to um, get the king in the center now black went king e7 and now it's an <clears throat> important point white needs to recognize that c5 c4 is really uh, a threat from from um, from the black side so white plays an important move, c4. Now black plays a6, h6, sorry. I actually skipped one important point, I'm sorry. On king, um, on king f8, sorry. Instead of king f1, White would have had the possibility here to play knight g5, which is not good because of king e7. And if white now takes on h7, black would have the possibility to play um, bishop h6, and the knight would be trapped and could only be saved by playing um, a move like h4. And for instance, rook h8, knight g5, and black <coughs> gets rid of its bishop, and he happily gives up a pawn for this. So this um, shouldn't um, shouldn't be played. White shouldn't. Uh, well, um, I like the English expression here. He he shouldn't um, be content with uh, with such small potatoes, so to say. He should keep the positional advantages. So uh, c4. Black now played um, h6, king e2, and now. <clears throat> Black exchanges one pair of rooks. Um, now, now is a key point here in this game, and um, this is um, about the obvious move rook d8. Black played rook b8, but rook d8 is a um, very essential point, <coughs> as you need to check um, what the position is like if rooks are exchanged. This is a um, is a general consideration here, not just in this position, um, even even after that, because the pawn structure is very fixed, and you need to consider um, what this end game is like. Is it winning? What what are the plans there? 
And in fact, um, rook d8 um, allows the exchange of rooks and it is completely winning after that. And um, this is uh, very impressive because um, it shows um, that white has a very clear plan to win. And um, this is a principle introduced in this book that you need to think in different stages of making progress in such a position. It's very static and you can basically think what's, what is the next stage of progress you, you can achieve. Um, let's put the exchange on the board. So what, what would uh, White like to do? The first step here um, would be to um, change the setup of the knight and the king. Um, one thing is the knight is very pretty on e4, but it doesn't attack any pawn. Okay, it um, takes a look on the c5 pawn, which is protected, and that's nice, but you never win this pawn. Um, it's a good idea here at the first stage of the important plan to get the king to e4 and the knight to d3, exactly to d3, to double attack the e5 pawn. Um, I'll just make uh, moves to, to get to this because black simply cannot do anything. White uh, starts with b3. Uh, that's uh, why. Oops, oops. Not, not backwards, of course. King d3. King d7. Knight to... What's the quickest route? Knight to c3. King e7. Knight to a4, king d7, king to e4, to e7, b2, king d7, knight d3, king d6. Of course, in a game, you don't need to calculate these seven or eight moves. You just need to envision this position after the exchange of rooks, which you can always, um, always achieve. The move b3 was necessary to get the square b2 for the knight to get this route complete to d3. And uh, if you look at this position beforehand, um, you will see that is that is almost a Zugzwang position. Black cannot move the king because it loses the e5 pawn. So black is pretty much reduced to moving the bishop from g7 to h8 or f6 and he cannot do anything, anything else. He cannot uh, do any meaningful meaningful um, moves with pawns or something. It's, uh, it's just a position where you don't have any moves. So what would be the next step? You need to get a second weakness. And this is achieved by pushing the kingside pawns. White goes h4 in this position. And um, this leaves black with a dilemma. What, what should he play now? He cannot play a move like g5, as white would just exchange and switch the knight over, and black will not be able to keep both pawns. This would be a complete Zugzwang, for instance, bishop f6, g4, moves here, f3, and now black cannot move anything, and you can steadily improve further here. What, what should black do? Let's say a3, a6, a4, a5, and now white just needs to get rid of the, the right to move and black will lose a pawn. So he cannot play something like g5. What else could he do? He could play h5. And then white has the nice move f4, which um, gets rid of um, the e5 pawn. This is not nice. It was a good weakness. But if you look at this position, white will simply pick up the g6 or h5 pawn. This is the nice thing um, about this, this lever f4. It um, opens up the way for the knight to attack the king side. So black cannot play h5. So what can he do? Just sit and wait. Then g4, h5 again uh, loses because of taking f4 and this pawn is gone. Now g5. So it's all it's all very straightforward. And let's say now black exchanges here. Stays put in f4. And again you see that the g6 pawn is falling. It's uh, it's completely completely straightforward. 
black is tied to the weakness on e5 and uh, simply cannot cannot do much while well, white is strengthening position so so um, hugely on the king side that he will win one of those pawns and black cannot do anything to prevent it and um, this is very important once you have recognized that um, black cannot exchange the rook because um, it, it simply always won because of this maneuver um, you uh, simply don't need to calculate this possibility anymore you can just when the possibility crops up you can just exchange rook and tr transpose to this kind of uh, endgame structure okay black cannot play rook d8 so he plays rook b8 just a waiting move so what now the maneuver on the king side which i described um, could be could be tried as well but the problem is that with the rook on it's not just um, the sit and wait position black can can do much more than um to um to fight in this in this position so um white should try to make progress first on on uh, on the other side so white goes rook d3 which um has the idea we'll see immediately of playing a4 and then try to um create a new weakness on the queen side black cannot do anything rook c8 rook b3 king d7 and now a5 and now we see that um, black cannot capture an a5 because a move like rook b5 would pick up both pawns so there's not much else to do black needs to allow this and now rook a to a3 and um, white has uh, managed to open up the queen side and can now enter with the rook either on the 8th rank or the 7th rank. Black goes bishop g7. Still he cannot do anything. b5 was also not possible because of the simple check here. And after a king move white just capture. oops. <laughs> white just captures on b5 and, um, and wins a pawn in addition. c5 is also basically gone. So this is not possible. Black just stays put. Rook a7, and now Uwe plays rook c7. In this position, actually, um, it would be rather thematic if um, Alakan here now, now just uh, would have exchanged. Yeah, he didn't because uh, he thought, I guess, that um, the way he played um, was equally strong. <clears throat> but uh, in this position, you, you know, White simply could could capture. And play exactly as I described um, um, after the rook exchange because it doesn't really matter that the a pawns are missing. Um, it would have won rather easily, just as that's just as shown. But um, Alakan played rook a8 with the idea of swinging the rook over to uh, to g8. Um, yeah, this move also has its points because um, if you look carefully. Huh, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Black's um, bishop simply has no move, and um, what he does is he continues to to attack here um, the various weaknesses until they fall. Rook e7 now, Rook c8 check, King d7 and Rook g8, and Black is simply reduced to waiting. He cannot do anything, and now White gains the space on the on the king side. Which also also shows um, a principle which is um, um, shown numerous times in the book, and this is a um, very famous one by now. But it was pretty much um, introduced and uh, popularized by this book. And this is um, um, the the slogan: uh, "Do not hurry." In this kind of positions don't do anything um, in a quick fashion. Just uh, stay calm and think about uh, improving the position first. Very often you have the time to um, play improving moves first and then win much easier. Um, it might take a little bit longer because you have to get all the improving moves in, but it's a much safer win than try to calculate everything to the end with forcing variations. So why just first does everything to improve his position? He goes over to the to the queen side, plays b3. Black is simply not not able to do anything. 
just calmly improving. And now he goes for g5, fixing all the weaknesses. Note that this um, very much complies with the um, strategy outlined after the rook exchange. So rook exchange would uh, also uh, still lead to the kind of winning plan with king on e4, knight on d3 and f4. So now with the perfect position of the rook on g8, which completely uh, dominates the bishop, it doesn't have any move at all. Um, now white even can bring the king up here. And now activates uh, the knight. And continuous attacks on the pawns on b6 and e6 actually uh, lead to to win of a pawn right here because uh, black cannot cover b6 anymore of course okay he, he covered it but then e6 was falling and uh, next move also g6 and so on basically all pawns are falling and black is um, is losing easily so this was a nice example of uh, of planning in the end game um what what you um really need to keep in mind is uh, this type of position here and it shows that um, in this kind of uh, static positions where you got a static advantage of a knight against the bishop here for instance that you can really think of um, single steps improving the position further and uh, finally as shown here breaking through with a move like oops like f4 to win uh, to win the pawn yeah, those thanks uh, for watching this um, video. I think it was a nice example of uh, demonstrating uh, two weaknesses. One weakness um, was very obvious um, in the beginning, the, the bet bishop on g7 and the pawns which um, on, on e5 and e6, which um, in a way yeah, are one weakness because um, the bishop on g7 is weak because of the, the pawn formation. But it shows that in order to win you need a second weakness. In, uh, in case of the rook exchange line, this was um, the pawn on, for instance, here g5, or the pawn on, on g6 or, e, of, or h5. This weakness was created by advancing further on the king side. And um, the way the game was played, the second weakness was the b6 pawn, and also the weak seventh rank, so the more active rook. Black's rook was simply reduced to just just hit put on the seventh rank, and Black wasn't able to move anything. So you need to create a second weakness to win. Usually, one weakness is not enough. So um, yeah, I think um, this book it's um, it's well known um, by now and already a classic, thirty years old, <laughs> but still very much uh, valid um, when it comes to to training um, endgame strategy. So um, if you are interested in the subject and I think it's a, it's a very um, fruitful fi field of study, um, I think you should try to get this book. Um, yeah, have a look at the, the description of the video where I'll put in um, the exact um, data about this. Yeah, thanks for watching and also um, yeah, be encouraged to um, to make suggestions um, about uh, new videos. I'll of course do um, more of these um, commentated blitz games which will be a steady feature of the channel but um, it's very welcome if you um, have specific suggestions um, for, for other subjects so um, <clears throat> just um, write me a message or write a comment um, in the video so I can uh, pick up ideas there. Yeah, thanks for watching and um, see you in the next video.